I now have the great pleasure to introduce Professor William Curtin. Uh, he and I have geographically intersected both at Brown and at Cornell Universities. And uh, he is the Director of Mechanical Engineering at EPFL in Switzerland. Please. Multiple phases, and it's very hard to, uh, to study those quantitatively. 
Now, if I look at one of those engineering materials, this is recent data um, from Rick Dangeloff who did the experiments and some modeling from uh, Martinez Cañeda um, and Tristan Jorgensen. But I'm not worried about the modeling. I just want to look at the data. And so this is the uh, uh, K. It's labeled as a threshold, but it's the fracture toughness. And this is a, a, an electrochemical cell, but this is just increasing hydrogen. So you should read from left, from right to left as increasing hydrogen. And it, this is fracture toughness. So if you're over here at low hydrogen content, uh, these materials, the fracture toughness is this value or bigger. It's just some, some value up here. These are valid fracture toughness tests. And when you cross some value of hydrogen content, suddenly the toughness goes from this value down to this value, which are relatively brittle materials. And whether or not, don't worry about the line. That's a, some theory I'm not going to worry about. I'm just looking at things that's tough and brittle. And so here's the transition macroscopically in terms of measurable quantity. The other thing you can measure is that once the material has failed or Brittle in that regime, you also get slow crack growth. And so, if you look at the crack growth rate, it's holding steady load, not uh, not cyclic loading. Uh, you see that over here, where the materials were very tough, there's essentially no growth. And notice this is microns per second. So, 10 to the minus 5 microns per second is a uh, tenth of an angstrom per second. So, I mean, this is this there's no growth here. Yet, when you're in the hydrogen embrittlement regime, you have some growth rates. They're still very small, uh, 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 2 microns per second, but definitely a slow crack growth behavior. So here's experiments. We'd like to understand when you go from this behavior to this behavior. Maybe it's continuous, maybe it's not. And what, what's underlying the slow crack growth? Now, the problem with hydrogen uh, embrittlement is that there's all kinds of things going on. It's hard to sort out what it is that is important and what's driving the phenomenon, driving the fracture. Is it really a fracture problem? Maybe it's just a deformation problem. You're changing the plasticity or the void growth, and it's not really a fracture problem. It's like a ductal fracture problem, and you're changing that. Uh, is it a corrosion problem? We saw some nice work, very long time uh, hydrogen exposure, 30 years, where it appears that what the hydrogen does is drive a chemical reaction and precipitates the grain boundaries which is a normal corrosive process. So there could be all different kinds of things going on that affect hydrogen improvement in, on, in the lab scale and over a 30 year scale. Uh, so we have many different phenomena and which of them are essential. Perhaps they're all coupled together. Perhaps it's, it's a sequence of things or a set of things that give us a problem. And maybe there are different, different materials that different phenomena controls what's going on. We all classify them as hydrogen. So this is extremely challenging. Uh, and there are no mechanistic predictive theories. And of course, if every material is different, maybe that's why we don't have any theories, because each material fails in its own way, a little bit like, uh, um, I think, Tolstoy's Unhappy Families at the beginning of Anna Karenina, where he says, all happy families are the same, all unhappy families are unhappy in the same way, maybe all hydrogen brittle in their own special way. That would be a problem for us theoretically. Now, if you look at the models, all models have two aspects to them. Hydrogen diffuses to the crack tip or into some unspecified fracture process zone around the crack. So you have to have the hydrogen transport. That makes the problem time dependent. And then the hydrogen causes cracking. Why it causes cracking, the mechanism not specified, but you have to have these two these two elements. Uh, without these, you can't get any results like the data. However, just putting the models with these two together doesn't imply that anything about the model is correct. Right? But if I diffuse hydrogen in the crack tip and then I have some sort of hydrogen dependent <coughs> failure phenomenon, I will predict hydrogen uh, As I said, the hydrogen could influence plastic flow, you sometimes see nanovoids, uh, there are all kinds of things happening, they may not be directly connected to fracture. So these are the two processes that one uh, will embed into any model. Uh, the generic modeling of the fracture is that diffusion of hydrogen 
is to the crack pivot is natural because hydrogen doesn't want to fit in the lattice. It has a misfit volume. And it's a, a, a larger, because it's interstitial, it's a large misfit, and it's attracted to the tensile field. Oop. It's attracted to the tensile field around the crack pivot. Now, if you look at a plastic field around the crack pivot, the stress isn't very high, so you wouldn't attract a lot of hydrogen. So sometimes now people are inducing are using gradient plasticity effects to increase the stress field to bring the hydrogen. Okay, uh, that's what we get with BPA these days. And the diffusion rate is also in question because you're diffusing the hydrogen and there could be traps, you know, dislocations, could be grain boundaries, could be precipitates. So, so we have two. So there's a diffusion process. But there's a, uh, you need the field and you need uh, the diffusion rate. So very generally, if I have a hydrostatic stress field, it's a function of K. And again, it could be elastic field, plastic field, uh, HRR field. Um, a hydrogen atom will see a uh, stress field. The chemical potential of the hydrogen will then be lowered by the, hydrogen, by the hydrostatic field times the misfit volume. The force is the gradient of the chemical potential, so there's force acting on the hydrogen atom at any position, and the velocity is related through the Einstein relation by uh, the diffusion coefficient. And so you get, uh, if you just look at the radial component, you have a radial force, and that's attracting the hydrogen toward the crack tip. So that's the diffusion part of the problem. And the fracture part of the problem we can think of the standard problem in fracture. Uh, you have a crack, you have a cohesive zone that allows the material to fail with some cohesive stress. And then you have a plasticity law, let's say K2 plasticity, could be gradient plasticity with some, uh, some flow stress. Normally I use my own computer to avoid these problems. <laughs> okay. I, I think the, the computer is telling us we should go back to Professor Kid Moore's law. Um, so if I look at the steady state fracture toughness divided by the brittle, the sort of Griffith fracture toughness of the cohesive zone, these are different gradient length scales. Don't worry about them. Just pick, pick one of them. And then the cohesive strength over the yield strength, you get some sort of curve like this. So the macroscopic toughness is many times larger than the microscopic brittle fracture so or cleavage kind of toughness, but it depends on this quantity. So when I add a hydrogen to the problem, I could lower the piece of strength. I could make it easier for the material to come apart, and that would drive this down here somewhere, and that would be a drastic loss in toughening. The other thing is the hydrogen could lower the intrinsic cohesive energy and just change the scale here, and that would lower the toughness. So this is a very generic fracture part of the picture. And the question is, can I diffuse enough hydrogen to the crack tip to change, Oops. yeah, maybe uh, I didn't screw the, uh, didn't put the screws in, so maybe. All right, so, so that picture was sort of work, but the question is, do I get enough hydrogen to the crack tip to either lower the cohesive strength or lower the cohesive energy enough to lower the toughness from huge values and generally, the answer is it's difficult to diffuse that much, as much hydrogen as you would need uh, when you think about the normal continuum. This is, not, this is the, <laughs> hopefully this is not the best we can do here. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the, the Serbians won the, uh, the, the, the local Belgrade team won their uh, soccer game, uh, football game last night. And so following in the manner of Football. I'm hoping that the chair will give me what we call injury time. <laughs> uh, so uh, the clock keeps, uh, referee keeps track of how much time we spend with uh, guys faking injuries on the field. Okay. Uh, all right. So usually the diffusion models don't provide enough hydrogen to get a big effect here or a big effect here, um, particularly when they're done in. And these pictures are very generic. So 
quantitative predictive, we want to understand the physical processes and the critical amounts of hydrogen. And if we can do that, then perhaps we could say something about why certain materials could be more resistant to certain microstructures. What I want to do is, is this, there's lots of complications. I want to simplify it to a basic fundamental problem, which is the nanoscale fracture mechanics, and see what we can learn. So let's step back and think about major modes of fracture. We have brittle fracture, which we saw real pictures of brittle cracks growing, which are governed by uh, the, the fracture toughness, the fracture energy, just the cleavage energy. If we have ductile failure, if I start with a sharp crack, I envision that, that the dislocation uh, are emitted from the crack, as we saw in an MV simulation, and that that blunts the crack. And once I blunt the crack, I decrease the, the local stress of the tip, make it harder to fracture, that happens, this is the rice criterion, which for the moment is fine, there's some stress intensity. And generally, this stress intensity is lower than K1C, so this process of emission happens first instead of this. Then I start blunting the crack. Once I blunt the crack, I can get more plasticity outside, and get more plasticity and more blunting, and more plasticity and more blunting, until I can start getting a real uh, blunted crack field and nucleate voids and inclusions ahead of the crack bed and end up with very high toughness due to ductile failure. So we have brittle mode, ductile mode, ductile mode, the final fracture toughness due to all of this plasticity, much, much higher than this fracture toughness. And we get large scale plasticity and very high toughness. So we're, we have these two fundamental things, the fracture toughness of the brittle material and the emission of dislocations, which starts this process. This is not the fracture toughness or the toughness, it's the, it's the the start of this process that enables the, the sharp crack to become blunted, and once it's blunted, all kinds of other good things happen that give us high toughness. So if I go back to the experiments, what do I see? Uh, I don't see a, a, a line like this. I see a threshold. I see materials that are tough and materials that are brittle. I see a threshold. We're crossing over from ductile to brittle with a certain amount of hydrogen. Same with the slow crack growth. I see no crack growth, and I see crack growth. I see a threshold in here. So there's some concentration of hydrogen under certain conditions that will change us from a ductile tough material to a brittle material. So my scenario is thinking that without hydrogen, we have this kind of picture, ductile failure. And with hydrogen, we have the following. We have plasticity in the far field. There are always dislocations out there. Still plasticity, Don't, it's not a brittle material like perfect silicon, but that the hydrogen aggregates at the crack tip and allows cleavage fracture locally at the crack tip with surrounding plasticity, but it never blunts out. And once it never blunts out, it can't develop the very large plastic zone and the void nucleation that gives me the very high toughness. So I end up with something that's quasi-brittle, it's cleavage like at the atomic scale with surrounding plasticity. So keep in mind, we still have far field plasticity. But we're going to be looking locally at the crack tip. So can hydrogen make this transition from this behavior to this behavior? Well, as Professor Kimura showed, if I take a, a pure material like nickel and I load it in a K field, forget about this is just boundary, boundary conditions in a K simulation, it starts emitting dislocations, emitting dislocations, blunting the crack, and as I do that, I keep increasing the macroscopic K, but of course, the stress at the crack tip is being lowered relatively because of the curvature, but I keep increasing the K. As I increase the K, I get more far field plasticity, and I'm starting to head toward ductile failure. So can hydrogen modify this behavior? Can it change this emission behavior in some way and suppress the emission? Well, there's some experimental evidence. We look at old experiments at Bihoff in iron 3% silicon, if you don't have any uh, hydrogen at all, you see the crack tip, the crack is open quite a bit, you see these very big slip bands, which presumably emanate from the crack tip. If you add a little bit of hydrogen, the crack becomes much sharper and you see much less uh, emanation of slip. And if you increase the hydrogen pressure even further, the crack becomes very sharp and you don't see, you see very little slip ahead of the crack tip. So it appears that hydrogen indeed does uh, suppress the uh, dislocation emission from the crack tip and enable a much sharper, cleaner crack. We saw some lovely experiments yesterday from Professor Barnouche on cantilever uh, specimens taking 
this down to the micron scale, and I think if we can analyze those more carefully, we may see similar behavior with and without hydrogen. So the ductile to brittle transition is now uh, the question of whether or not the crack can emit dislocations are blunt and blunt or not. It's a very local nanoscale question, but we've seen in Professor Kitamura's talk that the concept of fracture mechanics in K fields extend all the way down to the crack tip. You have to remember, in a plastic material, at a continuum scale, we model a plastic material with a plastic constituent law. But if I really go in and look in the material in the microscope, I see atoms and dislocations. The dislocations give me plasticity, and the atoms are straining elastically. So I really have an elastic field with dislocations, and dislocations give me all the shielding. And when we do continuum plasticity, we steer all that out. But locally here at the crack tip, I have a K field. And that K field is what's driving phenomena. So it's still correct to think about K fields even in the presence of plasticity. It's the plasticity <coughs> modeling, continuum plasticity, that loses, loses the K field very close to the crack tip. So the brittle can happen in two ways. One is I can take K1C, which is normally higher than K1E, and I can reduce it below. I can reduce it below K1E. Now the question is, can I reduce it enough? It's not sufficient to reduce it a little bit. It has to be reduced below this level. So it's, it's, it's not just the phenomena that it reduces. It has to be reduced enough. The other possibility is that I raise effectively K1E. I make this location emission harder, and it goes above K1C. Okay. So these are the two possibilities. And let's look at this one first. If it's blank, I can make up anything I want. So here's, oh boy. I always pray for an HDMI connection when I come to the VGA. So, here's the increase of K1E. This is nickel. Here's a relatively sharp crack tip. The black are hydrogen atoms. And if I allow hydrogen diffusion, which I'm not showing, it aggregates around the crack. This is all you get. This is equilibrium hydrogen. It wants to go to the surfaces. There's a little bit inside, but that's it. But that's sufficient. At this load, you would normally admit a dislocation. But now you don't. That amount of hydrogen just enough to keep from emitting a dislocation. That means that I can load higher, and if I load higher, I get a stronger uh, K field, and I bring in more hydrogen. Then I start building up hydrogen around the crack. Because of the higher K, I still can't emit a dislocation, so I can load it even higher. Now this is the microscopic K near the crack tip. The applied K is something different due to the surrounding plasticity. This is, again, the crack tip picture. So I can keep this process going. I keep bringing in more hydrogen, more hydrogen. And finally, the only thing that it can do, oops, I'm hitting the wrong button. The only thing it can do is there are no dislocations can get in and out of this material. It's like a dislocation-free zone, but graded by the fact that when I put hydrogen in the nickel, it's very hard to emit a dislocation. And at some point, it bleeds, right? because this is really a relatively brittle material. We saw a nice, uh, uh, yesterday also about the continual modeling of this kind of growth, and this is exactly what happens. So what's happened is I've suppressed the dislocation emission, and the only thing left is the cleave. So now I have this sharp crack with surrounding plasticity, but I can't get the blunting. Now the same thing happens at a grain boundary, and we remember we saw cleavage along a grain boundary, and it's simply that the grain boundaries are a little easier to cleave than the bulk nickel, but it's the same process. We, add, we get a little hydrogen along the grain boundary, but then we build up a little region, and then finally it splits, and it splits along the grain boundary because that's the lowest energy, and that's, that's easier to do than doing in the bulk. So the process happens whether you're in the bulk or in the grain boundary, but preferentially happen at the grain boundary. Now, I want to remind you that these are these low values of K1C that you see. These are the crack tip values. Okay? They, those are this value here, essentially. It's not this value. The surrounding plasticity gives you, gives you this value. It's, in the, these plots, this toughness does not include ductile fracture 
processes. So the measured toughness may be up here somewhere. The local toughness is what's changing down here. And ductal fracture can be much more toughness. So how do we relate this aggregation and brittlement to conditions of diffusion, uh, time, load rate? Well, we have the kinetics of diffusion. We now have a fracture condition. We know how much hydrogen we need and what load. So we go back to this problem and we look at the elastic field because around the crack locally, even though we have dislocations, we have elastic field, and we can work out how much hydrogen will come to the crack tip in a certain amount, at a certain loading rate, a certain amount of time, all the hydrogen in some radius used to the crack tip. Other hydrogen will come into that radius, but all of this will come to the crack tip, so we can calculate how much hydrogen per unit length of crack comes by integrating over the cylinder that has collected hydrogen. And I get some complicated, messy result, but that's okay. It just the, the total amount of hydrogen under a constant loading rate scales with the current stress intensity to the eight fifths, which comes out from the K field. And this coefficient is this, which involves the diffusion rate, the misfit volume, the concentration, the temperature, and the loading rate. So this is the relationship between how much hydrogen I get at the crack tip as and the current stress intensity is a function of diffusion, hydrogen concentration, temperature, and loading rate. Now, this parameter determines whether I'm going to embrittle her or not. There's a critical value for this. If this, exceed, if this parameter exceeds a critical value, that means I have enough hydrogen or a fast diffusion or a slow loading, I'll get embrittlement. That is, I can aggregate the hydrogen before I emit the dislocations. If I'm below this level, that means I'm in low concentration, low diffusion, slow diffusion, or fast loading, then I get no embrittlement because I don't have enough time for the hydrogen to come before I start blunting the crack. So now there, this is our threshold condition. Are we above or below this value? And we get this value from our simulations. So simulations either show us ductal behavior, this is the amount of hydrogen near the crack tip, this is the K, we either see ductal behavior or we see brittle behavior, and there's a threshold, some critical value somewhere in this range for this A0 star. And if I'm over here, the material will cleave, and if I'm over here, I'll emit dislocations, and that's the start of the ductal behavior, the ductal fracture. If we look at this in nickel, we don't have all the precise numbers and we did this for blunted cracks, but let's just look at sharp cracks. The lattice diffusion in nickel is 10 to minus 14, and with traps, you're probably somewhere in here in clean nickel, but with dislocations and, uh, and other small traps. And as a function, these are different hydrogen concentrations where you'll get a brittlement. Those Monell K500 experiments fall right down here. They're embrittled around 500 parts per million, and so if the diffusion constant is somewhere in here, we would predict embrittlement. Those Bechtel experiments are embrittled about 1,000, and again, if the diffusion coefficient is somewhere around here, then we would predict that these materials should be embrittled at the strain rates and, and test conditions. So there's no fitting here, but we're not making an exact prediction, but we see that what we find for this embrittlement condition, we're in about the right ballpark. The other part that I had not, uh, that I mentioned was that after you cleave, uh, the hydrogen will follow the crack tip. And you might think, well, that might be a slow process, but in fact, if you start with the crack here, and this is all the hydrogen in the three-dimensional picture, if you click the uh, movie here, if you now just let the hydrogen diffuse in, if you see the hydrogen diffusing, <laughs> oh boy, okay. All right. This, we did the 600 Kelvin to accelerate the diffusion in 15 nanoseconds. The hydrogen has moved from here to around the new crack tip. So, this, so all, once the hydrogen is aggregated, it can move along the 
Now that was 600 Kelvin, even if I do it, and this is the next video, which we're not going to get to see, if I do it at room temperature, a slightly higher K, in 70 nanoseconds, a lot of this hydrogen will end up over here. And so, because there's a very strong driving force, that local K field is pulling the hydrogen with it, once I've aggregated the hydrogen, then most of that hydrogen can carry along. So as a consequence, to continue crack growth, I only need to saturate new crack surface. As the crack grows, I just have to cover the surfaces with hydrogen. The rest of the hydrogen gets carried along. So I only need to diffuse in a little bit of hydrogen. And you can calculate then how much hydrogen you need. And you can calculate the crack growth rate. And it's given by this. This the amount of crack growth varies very slowly with that. So there's a certain predicted crack growth rate. That's right up there, A dot. A dot. There it is, A dot. Quickly to the data. Here's the data, and there's the prediction, absolute, uh, that, there's the prediction of uh, the crack growth rate again, against this nickel material. It's not perfect, but it's very close and shows the same trend as the experiments. So there's a threshold. The threshold is when I cross over that A0 star, and then there's a slow crack growth regime, and I predict that, that the more hydrogen I have, or the higher K, or whatever, the faster the crack will grow, and that's what we see. So good agreement in magnitude. Uh, we have published, and I showed this a few years ago, same thing on ferritic steels. I won't repeat it because I'm running out of time, even with injury time. <laughs> I'm getting injury time, right? Uh, <laughs> Um, and, and we found uh, in all of these ferritic steels that we could predict the embrittlement in all of them except for one. And for the one of them, our condition is that this number is, is less than one or, or greater than one, and we're very close to that. And all the rest of them, we predicted this. So for both nickel and iron, very, very clean systems, not a lot of microstructure and other things, uh, as a function of different hydrogen concentrations, different materials, different loading rates, which could be um, actual loading rates or estimated loading rates, we can predict the embrittlement. OK, so that was, uh, that was this process here, where the hydrogen aggregation makes dislocation emission hard and basically makes locally makes the material look more like silicon than like nickel or iron. The other process is the second process which is maybe I can reduce K1C enough and then I don't care about the dislocation emission. Now, uh, Zhou and Zong have just done some new first principles DFTs of quantum mechanical calculations of the surface energy of hydrogen on nickel. And what you see is this is the pure, this is the fractured toughness that comes from that energy. And for pure nickel, you get a fractured toughness up here, and K1E is down here. That's why nickel emits dislocations. As you saturate the, the surface, as you add hydrogen, this goes down. But at 50% bulk coverage, or 100% bulk coverage, if I separate at 50% on the surface, so the most I can get is 50%. And I'm still up here at K1C, and that's above K1E. So for a long time, we thought this process can't occur because we're still, at this point, well above K1E, and the materials can emit dislocations. You can't go to 100% coverage because there's no place for the hydrogen to go here. You can only go to 50% coverage. So this is what was driving the other model that we were always stuck here. However, we now realize it's a very subtle fact that hydrogen likes to be together slightly. That's why you form hydrides. And if you take dilute hydrogen and you aggregate it into three layers, the hydrogens like to be slightly together. And that lowers the energy of this structure. It won't happen away from the crack tip due to entropy. But near the crack tip, it will happen. And now, when I fracture this material, I have hydrogen on the surface at 50% and hydrogen in the subsurface at 100%, and that fracture energy is lower than the fracture energy when I don't have this extra hydrogen. 
Well, there's an extra contribution in the surface energy or reducing the surface energy compared to the, to the original surface where it just had 50% coverage. And then if some of this hydrogen now can diffuse to the surface where it really wants to be, I can make the, fra the fracture energy of this is actually less than zero. The material wants to spontaneously come apart. So, so if I have this process of the uh, hydrogen aggregating in three layers in nickel, and then it can fracture due to this, maybe it can and maybe it can't, I'll show you in a moment, and then when it goes to this, it's never going back. It's, it's, it's negative energy, it's much lower than the, than the original bulk energy. So here's the, here's the surface energy I showed you before, which you can go up to 50%, you can keep covering it, but there's no way to get there. With three, ener with three layers, the energy goes from here to here, and then with that local diffusion, now I've got enough to get to 100%, I can get down to here. So this is the most I can get in the bulk, but if I get it in three layers, the fracture energy, or fracture energy goes down to here, and then I get local diffusion, and the fracture energy goes to zero. Now this is gamma. If I put this on the K1C plot, what do I get? Here's K1C. I can't get here naturally, but with the three layers, I go down here. And now I'm below K1E, and then that diffusion, and I'm way down here. And so this material is now really brittle. This K1C is lower than K1E. But I have to aggregate the three layers of hydrogen. Just one single layer of hydrogen won't do it. Well, the diffusion process will give us that aggregation of hydrogen. If I look at assisted by the crack tip stress field, that's the diffusion, but also the ener energetics. So I have the concentration just at the crack tip, and I have a far field concentration of C0, then in equilibrium, the chemical potential of the hydrogen in the bulk and the chemical potential of the hydrogen at the, at the crack tip have to be equal. And at the crack tip, I have the entropy term. I have the driving force due to the pressure around the crack field and the hydrogen-hydrogen interaction. This should be CH here. And that should be equal to essentially the entropy of the hydrogen far away. If you look at this, that's the misfit volume. I was using omega before. That's the hydrogen-hydrogen binding energy in nickel. We can calculate that. And that's the pressure field right near the crack tip. And we go right near the crack tip within a few angstroms. So if I put that in, I can calculate how much hydrogen is at the crack tip as a function of temperature. And you can see that I can get very close to 100% depending on the K value. And if we focus on these guys at room temperature, I can get 100% aggregation around the crack tip at room temperature at a K with a local K which is below the emission K and is around the fracture K. So the aggregation, go back to this picture. So this aggregation process near the crack tip happens at room temperature as equilibrium at room temperature at K values where you can get the fracture at K values that are down here in the 0.5 range. So that means that this process can happen. It's thermodynamically favorable. And this provides us with a real embrittlement process where it's a hydrogen-enhanced decohesion, but it's not just pure surface energy. Hydrogen has gotten there. It has to aggregate not just on the surface, but in a slight bulk region. And um, that lowers the surface energy. So I'll summarize. Hydrogen, to me, is a duct with a brittle transition. We go from one of these pictures, one of these pictures, Fortunately, these pictures you've seen before, so it's <laughs> We go from... <laughs> All right, it must be time for coffee. Uh, we go from the blunting ducto fracture picture to very locally a cleavage picture at the crack tip because the hydrogen there either blocks emission or really can enable real cleavage behavior 
due to the aggregation of hydrogen. Both of those mechanisms seem to operate in nickel. The first one probably can operate in most materials. The second one may depend much more on, the, on, on thermodynamics, but it operates in nickel, which is what, and what we see experimentally. So what I've done is shown you two uh, operative mechanisms for a ductile, ductile to brittle mechanism totally controlled by the hydrogen. And as best as we can uh, compare with experiments on clean materials in nickel and iron, uh, it explains the experiments reasonably well. Now, in real complicated materials, there will be many other, many other complications. And I haven't told you what the toughness is. I've just told you the conditions under which you can get a brittle But And that may be as far as we can go. But that may be just quite good enough for the purpose of understanding and designing new materials. So with that, I'll finish. Uh, injury time is over. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for your nice uh, idea. I uh, couldn't catch up the mechanism of the increase of uh, K1E by hydrogen. I mean, uh, how the hydrogen can suppress the dislocation emission from a plastic? So, I don't think this, oh, this is on. OK. So uh, if we just take the rice criterion itself, when you add hydrogen into nickel, you increase the unstable stacking fault energy. You make it, and nickel hydride is really a very brittle material. Nickel hydride does not easily, saddle, uh, easily uh, support dislocations. So as the hydrogen increases around the crack tip, it's harder to slip on those planes, and the K1E goes up. So I, I didn't. Sh we calculated these things, but, but that's the mechanism. So how do you think about the example of iron? With iron, with yeah. We don't have a hydride. How do they? Oh no, you do have hydrides in iron, right? It's so uh, iron has a, a, a double HCP hydride, but here keep in mind that the only reason we have a hydride here or something like a hydride is because we're very close to the crack tip and the stresses are very high. So there is no hydride out in the bulk. You're very far away from normal hydride. So people look and they say, oh, look at that hydride near the crack tip. We don't see hydride in iron or nickel, right? But this is very, this is on a scale of just a few nanometers around the crack tip. And it's almost not observable experimentally. So, so it's not a it's not a normal hydride, but both nickel and iron form hydrides. Yeah, so it's like a hard particle, right? The hydride is like it's it's, it's a precipitate that's formed ahead of the crack tip. How um, how much hydrogen is necessary in this separate question, but that it becomes like a precipitate and it blocks the dislocation. And because it's precipitating along the entire length of the crack, right? I don't care where the crack is, that's where the precipitate forms. So it's not like a normal precipitate where the crack can go around it. Or it's, it's totally encompassing the crack front because of the hydrogen coming in. Thanks for allowing the clarifications. Um, <laughs> one coffee. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll, I'll try to keep it short. So, very interesting talk, Captain. Uh, apparently, you're still with uh, the video not working. But, uh, so I was just wondering, but, but really, this might be fundamental understanding of how these two mechanisms, there are two ways actually that you could also influence uh, whether or not the uh, hydrogen and blue would occur or not, right? Uh, well, I guess, like, of course you cannot control the hydrogen diffusion, but uh, anything alloying uh, that you can do to, to solve like Yes, prevent so, so uh, the first mechanism is probably a little bit hard to prevent, but both of them rely on the fact that hydrogen likes to be near itself. There's a slight attraction of hydrogen to itself in an FCC lattice. But there's chemistry. So if you alloy, in fact, I think that uh, Professor Ritchie might have showed, or someone might have showed, 
that the high entropy alloys are more resistant to hydrogen embrittlement than normal nickel or normal stainless steel. And I think what's happening is that the local hydrogen energies are spread, instead of being very narrow, they're spread over a range, and it prevents the full aggregation of hydrogen to a high enough level to enable this embrittlement. And so those materials are only embrittled under much higher hydrogen concentration, which drives more hydrogen to the practice. And that's what's seen experimentally, that under normal conditions, those materials are not embrittled, but new data that just came out this year from Robertson's group shows that if you really pump in hydrogen, they will be embrittled. And I think it's because the alloying prevents this process from happening. So there is hope that we can think about chemistry and designing alloys to be more resistant. Whether or not we can solve them, solve it entirely, but as an engineering question, we want to delay it as long as possible. That's what we do. Thank you so much for a fascinating